and then some other guys heard it and they did some hip hop that was like crazy, you know, beats for Carlos. Since we had Damali, they wanted something for the guys. I mean, and so what starts to happen is when you bring people together from all these different disciplines, it just kind of like goes in this artistic spiral and everybody's got their little piece in it. So, uh, and it's all, all good. So I just want to say thank you uh, for, for that. And with that, I will read the prologue here from um, Minion, which is the first book in the, in, the, uh, in the series. And it's sort of, the setting is the child in, that, I'm, that you'll hear about in the story, the baby, is the slayer who, or the, the huntress who, you know, come, but this is when she's a little, little baby in the crib and this is where it all kind of begins down in New Orleans 20 years ago. And this is her mother, her mother's story. Sarah Richards stood in the middle of her bedroom trying to console her infant who was wailing at the top of her tiny lungs. Yes, she knew what pain was and wanted to cry out as much as her baby was carrying on right now. Instead, silent tears slid down the sides of her face as she turned her chin up to the ceiling and shut her eyes. How, Lord? was a preacher's wife supposed to deal with the fact that her husband was having an affair. For months, she denied the obvious, but now her husband's lies regarding his whereabouts had been found out. He'd even violated the sanctity of their home by bringing this woman to their bed, their marital bed. Evidence in the form of the marriage violator's perfume and blood still clung to the sheets. She'd only been gone an hour on a church errand her husband had contrived for her to do. One hour, and now this? Sarah covered her mouth and turned away, hastening from the sight and stench of the filth, taking her baby girl to lay her in a crib. With her hands trembling, she left the screaming infant, whose wails intensified as she turned away from her. Shame burned through Sarah. How could she call the church elders or talk to Mother Stone about something like this? How did a preacher's wife, the first lady of the church, force her lips to say that her husband, the Reverend Richards, had lost his natural black mind? <laughs> Amid the now hiccuping cries from the nursery, Sarah became very still as she heard movement in the small clapboard house below her. There were two voices, one soft, seductive, the other was that of her husband. He brought this whore back to his home again? Once wasn't enough? Did he think she was so foolish as to run another errand at night again so he could get away with doing God knows what? Couldn't he hear his own child screaming her lungs out? And wouldn't he know his wife was upstairs? Did he have so little respect for her, or was it that this whore's poor was that strong? Tears of bitter rage and hurt stung Sarah's eyes. The pain of her acknowledgement almost crushing her ribcage as the muscles around her heart constricted. This woman, this transgressor, had a hold on her husband that not even the Lord could seem to break because Father God knew she prayed on it from the first inkling of doubt. Now, her husband had brought a violator back into his house. Correction, her house. A home designed for a minister, his wife, and children across the street from hallowed ground Sarah felt her knees begin to buckle as she envisioned the faces of loyal parishioners who hung on the good reverence every word, just as she once had. This house was not a home, nor was it a place where she or her child could find peace. She resisted her first instinct, which was to barrel downstairs to confront her husband and the heifer that had crossed her threshold. But something slithered inside Sarah's soul and gave her pause. The green-eyed monster raised its ugly head. She had to know what this hussy looked like. Who was this woman that could break up hearth and home using something that all women had? She wanted to spy and know the things her husband said to this home record. What lies had Armand Richards told? Silently, like a thief in the night, Sarah Richards crept down the hall, hugging the wall. She knew this house by heart and easily avoided the creepy floorboards. Stretching her body, she clung to the very paint as she peered around the corner of the landing. The baby's cries escalated, her pulse rising with it. She held her breath as she rounded the corner and froze. A tall, handsome male figure, the color of cafe au lait, and dressed in an impeccable black suit, 
ran a palm across her husband's jaw. The caress was sensuality personified. The sight stole the scream from Sarah's lungs as her husband closed his eyes, dropped his head back in a display of sheer feminine submission. Sarah took the stairs one by one, clutching the handrail to keep from passing out. She couldn't breathe as she watched in abject horror as this man, a man, not a woman, embraced her husband like a lover, lowered his head to Armand's exposed throat. And when she heard her husband groan, something fragile inside her snapped. Everything became a blur. Her feet flew down the stairs. Her screams outstripped her infant daughters. The words became a chant. God, no, not that. She would crucify this beast, this fowler of her household. There was no rational thought as she hurled herself forward, trying to grab hold of his broad shoulders. She wanted blood, a pound of flesh. But the agile intruder simply swept her husband up in his arms as though he was sweeping away a bride and deftly slipped through the door with him. Sarah gave chase into the front yard, screaming, crying, hollering behind them, but only the night heard her. She spun in a crazed circle, searching the darkness for them. Where had this lover taken her husband? And so quickly, Sarah fell to her knees in the gravel driveway. The stones cut through her nightgown and pierced her knees. Bloody, she laid outstretched, sobbing the futile prayer. A man, it was a man, did Jesus in heaven know? A man, gorgeous, Jet black penetrating eyes, regal carriage, flawless skin, thick black lashes, onyx curls, and with shame any woman a man. Please know a man that stood six two with a solid frame and enough strength to lift her husband as if Armand was a baby? No. She heaved and vomited, wiped her mouth, and clawed the dirt until she could push herself upright. She stared up at the sky and then at the lit window of her daughter's room. Sarah walked slowly back to the house and reached for the telephone. The church matriarch should send her daughter Marlene to look after the baby tonight. She heard an inner voice speak to her. Marlene was good with infants. She was a nice young woman. Right now, Sarah Richards had an errand to run, one that she put off all these months. She needed something more than prayer. You see, her husband was with a man, and the church elders didn't know nothing about pain like that. The old lady who lived on the edge of the swamps had potions and such to correct these kinds of abominations, and what Sarah would tell her would stay between her and the old witch. So. <laughs> gotten a lot of feedback from readings. This is not a slam on anybody gay. What this is, is it's showing how sometimes what you think you see is not what you see. She's thinking she's seeing this encounter with her husband. This is the vampire. This is the beginning of it. And this is why the baby was screaming her head off, because the baby has second sight. So anyway, that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Terry Crews kind of dude, 
um, into an Arab. They changed JL, who was an Asian dude, yeah, and made him um, a, a woman. I mean, they changed. Wow. Wow. It was so deep, y'all. I can't. <laughs> I used to like sit there, you know, every time the phone would ring and say, "I hope this isn't the movie deal." Now, I, now I never thought of it. I would ever chant against myself, <laughs> but because it would have been, you know, it would have changed my life if they financially if they had made it. But I didn't want them to make it like that. I really yeah, didn't. Wow. I just couldn't. Yes, ma'am. I just want to know what was their justification for making all those changes? They were like, oh, we have to make it more and make it more appealing. We have to cross it over, blah blah blah. You know, I mean, it's the same. It's the same reason why on my covers, like my, my heroine, she starts off a very brown sister, but but the end, she's in this. You know, you can't really recognize her. I mean, she changes skin tone about five times through these covers. She's going lighter and lighter and lighter. So that it's, it's a lot of drama. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else? Any thoughts? No? Um, Ms. Banks will be here to sign books uh, for you this evening. And, oh, we have one more? Oh, so, yes. I have yes, ma'am. First of all, that was really exciting and very unexpected. How do you come up with your ideas? Do you, uh, is it stream of consciousness? Do you uh, just write what comes through you? Or do you, crafted very carefully, like with a, an out, some type of outline? No, well, I think it's a combination, um, because usually my characters come from a rant. Like, I'll watch news, <laughs> and I'll see stuff, and I'm like, that is just crazy. They put a baby in a dumpster, or, you know, whatever it is that I see that really is outrageous. Some, I watch a lot of political news, so that there's no, <laughs> there's no reason why the, the metaphor then didn't come out that um, there's old white men in hell that sit at a table that bleeds black blood uh, metaphor for oil <laughs> and are running hell, and they're, they're the ones that create the vampires, okay? Um, <laughs> all straight off of Dick Cheney and crew. I mean, I'm, I'm being real. <laughs> Because I was looking at Halliburton Corporation and how they were doing stuff, and I thought, ooh, that's the Vampire Council. Yeah. <laughs> and so I start off, I mean, it's, it can be something like that, and then I start to like shape it and bring it into like an outline. Um, sometimes there'll be something that happens in the world that is so outrageous that it sounds like science fiction, and it pulls into my work. For example, when there was the tsunami, that was over in Indonesia that killed 100,000 people like in four minutes or something. They said that the earthquake that created when that when it shook the earth for that wave, that it made the earth stop turning for like a fraction of a second. And I'm like, something is so powerful that the earth stopped turning? Wait a minute. So that meant time stopped for a fraction of a second and the poles were off so you notice like all the dolphins and whales and everything were beaching themselves because it, true north is not true north anymore. Right. And I was like, I gotta use this. Because that means if, wait, if true north is no longer true north, and if time stopped for a fraction of a second, what does that do to astrology? Mm. I'm just saying. So, <laughs> so it can start with a question. You see something that happens that's real and it's science fact, and then you just take it another couple steps beyond to make it science fiction. And that's where the creativity comes in. But, but you have to get your science facts right. So I was on like Nat Geo and Discovery and going to, you know, like the earthquake uh, websites that scientists go into. Like, I would call up people who have a, um, an expertise. I have a friend that's an engineer and another friend that um, does physics. And I'm like, okay, if I'm going to dematerialize a human being and make them walk through a wall, and they're like, okay, Leslie, all right, what, what entity are we talking about now? <laughs> you know, so, 